Hi, I'm Emily Hayes, senior writer with The Pink Sheet. I'm here at the Biotech Showcase at the Park 55 in San Francisco, interviewing presenting companies at the meeting and also talking to big pharmas who are here. And here with me right now, I have Jason Coloma. He is the VP, Global Head of Oncology Partnering at Roche. Hi, Jason. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how about you? Great, thanks for having me. So what are your interests in the Biotech Showcase and in the meeting generally in terms of partnering? Yeah, so we have three general areas where we're looking for partnerships right now. Um, one of them is in what we call molecular information and real-world data, sort of represented in the deals that we did with Foundation Medicine and Flatiron Health. Uh, the other areas where we're starting to do is more clinical trial collaborations externally. Uh, so we've done things even pharma to pharma with Celgene and Amgen, for example, uh, thinking about ways that we can deliver innovative therapies to patients. And the last is probably more traditional business development and licensing, where we're focused mainly on cancer immunotherapy. And we're also looking at what we molecular targeted therapy, which is basically looking at things that are more traditional oncology approaches. And so in the past, you've had an approach that seemed to emphasize having everything all under Roche's roof. Um, what is the plan now in terms of the balance of in-house versus external development? Yeah, I think the, if you look at where the science and the medicines are really driving us right now, I think obviously the idea of combinations either in doublets or even triplets of targeted therapies is really the advent of where oncology care is going. And recognizing that means that you won't have everything in-house in and you just can't you know, research and develop and market all of these different therapy options. So you have to think externally. And that's where we started to do these clinical trial collaborations. And it's been a real focus of our efforts last year. And we have dedicated staff now doing this. Uh, we have people here in South San Francisco focused on working with our late stage organization, thinking about these things. This uh, Last year in 2015, we did seven of these type of agreements. And we're looking to do more uh, going forward. And what is the current thinking on combinations of immunotherapies? It seems like it's a moving target in terms in terms of which checkpoint is, uh, inhibitors look most interesting and in various tumor types. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that the jury's still out as the data is being generated for particular indications um, and that we're just going to have to see how that develops over time. And we're really encouraged obviously with our data uh, that you've seen and uh, obviously in, blood, uh, in bladder cancer uh, that allowed us to have breakthrough status on atezolizumab. Um, but we'll have to see, as we, I think you're going to see differences probably at the indication level even uh, for these different PD versus PDL1 and the different combinations. And we heard recently at the Society of Melanoma Research meeting in San Francisco that the performance of oncolytic vaccines looked, was looking pretty good. Um, what's your opinion on the mm. role of vaccines in immunotherapy now? Mm, yeah, uh, so not, I thought you were going to go on, on, oncolytic viruses, but you went on, okay, vaccines. So vaccines, I think, yeah, they are very promising. I mean, I think in the, in the sense of creating um, sort of that, initiating that immune response necessary uh, that could potentially be used in combination with some of these checkpoints, is the data is very encouraging. So I think definitely going forward, you're going to see these types of plays. A couple companies announced that they were being launched in that space, of even going to thinking about personalized vaccines using neoantigen approaches. And I would say scientifically, we are very intrigued with that concept. And uh, can you, do you have any comment on the valuation of assets nowadays and whether that presents opportunities for Roche? So I think you're probably, there's a couple areas that we start to monitor and kind of, kind of think about in terms of trends. So one of those being sort of access to capital for startups. And that could be, of course, in the form of IPOs and venture capital money. And then you think about, you know, the merger acquisition environment. And then you look at the deal that comp all of our competitors are doing and sort of what's the landscape of those, that type of deal making. So if you look at those individually, I, the IPO market is a little bit choppy right now, I think to say the least, uh, but it does, there's uh, interesting companies that continue to file for their IPOs, um, including some of our uh, collaboration partners, uh, and I think that we'll see how that goes over the next couple months. Uh, from a standpoint of venture money, I think it's safe to say that they're continuing to heavily invest in these areas uh, where there's a huge opportunity to address unmet medical needs like in oncology. Uh, the M&A market, I think, safe to say if you analyze every pharmaceutical company's pipeline and where they need to go in terms of growth as, uh, and the ability to do those deals with their cash flow, um, it wouldn't be surprising to see additional deals around, uh, which is an opportunity for biotechs. So just because the IPO market is not necessarily, or if the jury's still out on that, the other avenues are still there, which is venture money, 
as well as M&A exits for companies. So I think the valuations will continue to, to be in this range for the for foreseeable future. And uh, which assets, which types of assets do you think are looking most attractive right now in oncology? In the oncology space? So I think if you think about, um, at least from our vantage point of cancer immunotherapy, and then you look at um, sort of the more traditional molecular targeted approach, in cancer immunotherapy, there's a lot of activity in checkpoint inhibitors or next generation types of checkpoint inhibitors, but there's interesting areas uh, also thinking about harnessing the immune system, so natural killer cell types of approaches, macrophage approaches, these vaccines and oncolytic viruses that also have a role in the cycle of eliciting immune response. So all of these kind of areas where you're seeing the money, it's sort of follow where the money's going, and I would say those areas are very interesting. I think in cancer immunotherapy, therapy, there's also the challenge of how we develop the drugs. So if you think about um, that preclinical models aren't very successful in predicting clinical uh, response, there's a lot of unmet need there in terms of science and technology. Could we get better at that? Um, and any breakthroughs on that would be very advantageous to companies. Uh, the other areas in terms of these combination options is that we can't really reliably predict safety um, of these combinations. We have to generate that data. We have a good hypothesis, uh, but we, have, we don't have a necessarily a way to model that. So any of these type of, I would call, enabling technologies uh, would be real breakthroughs in these, in, to help with um, R&D. And what is your thinking about CAR-T therapy in terms of the potential to expand beyond hematology indications? And what is Roche's current interest in that space? Yeah, so we've taken a perspective of focusing on T-cell bispecifics as our approach. Um, and, and in particular, we have a couple things in development, um, in early development, that are focused on that. I think, and we've also done um, a very early stage deal that could be considered more of a cellular approach with a company called Squeeze, uh, which was a company f uh, spun out of Bob Langer's lab and funded by Polaris that gives a different type of approach uh, to, to CAR-T. So we see some obviously very encouraging data from the CAR-T. Is it limited to only the extracellular targets like CD19? I think this, there's still left to be seen. There might have to be some additional technology advances to see if you can go after intracellular targets that would expand the scope and maybe go after other indications, including solid tumors. Uh, but I think that, that there would still have to be some advancements there. So we like our approach. We've taken our bet, which is right now in the T-cell bispecifics, um, and we are really encouraged by the data that we see, start to see there. And just one final question. Do you have any impressions you'd like to share from the meeting so far? Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of very strong energy this year. I mean, you come to these things and you're not sure. Um, it kind of gives you a nice roadmap of where you think the, uh, sort of the excitement's going to be. And I think the idea, if you have a really good idea scientifically uh, and, and the ability to raise capital is still there. I think the M&A market still seems to be very um, attractive to uh, to biotechs right now. So I think it's, a, it's still going to be a very encouraging year, I think, and a very good year in terms of deal making for, for 2016. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.